Aloha, this is Professor Porter. Uh, this is part one of a 10 part series about the introduction of mock trial. Uh, this uh, first part is dedicated to the mock trial basics. This is an attempt to get off the ground, get everyone on the same path, uh, talk about the same foundational uh, tenets as it relates to mock trial. So we're going to go over a number of topics today. It's going to be faster than it needs to be. Uh, it's going to be a little longer than it needs to be. Most of the stuff to most people is going to be review rather than introduction. But uh, my hope is that everyone sees something um, uh, they haven't heard before or that's new to them or that's a good review. So let's talk about uh, the basics of mock trial. As always, uh, I'm going to say to subscribe to the channel, W Portable at W Portable. Uh, you can contact me. You can follow the hashtags. You can also contact me directly by email. Uh, but I do want to hear from you to figure out uh, where this should go, where our discussion should go as it relates to the basics. Please do so. Well, here we go. Here's some of the uh, basics that we're going to talk about. Uh, players and the roles at trial, parts and order of trial, the geography of trial, rules and customs of trial, goals and limits of trial. I mean, each one of these, I'm looking at it right now, and I suppose this is the way it's supposed to work. Could be its own video in and itself. I'm going to try to do a couple slides and a couple topics, to, again, just to get you to that foundational point. So let's talk about the Next, we talk about the players and the roles at trial. And to think about the players first, it's two terms that are going to be very familiar to you, and it's just a matter of organizing them in a mock trial sense. In mock trial, you're thinking A versus B. Every once in a while, we got a corporate entity. Every once in a while, we got a company in a civil case, but it's really A versus B. It's Jones versus Smith, or it's Jones versus new company uh in a civil case it's really just a versus b and you got to think of that a versus b as plaintiff versus defendant those are the players and those are how you're organized as teams in mock trial there's a plaintiff's counsel team and witnesses and there's a defense counsel team and their witnesses uh, that's how it breaks down that's how your roles are defined uh, in a criminal case, it, it, it's even more simple because the plaintiff is always the same. The plaintiff is always the government. The plaintiff is always the prosecution. So it's the state versus Smith, the United States versus Jones. And almost always in a criminal context, we're talking about an individual as the criminal defendant. So again, you have a prosecution team. You have a government team of lawyers and their witnesses for mock trial. You have the criminal defendant's defense team. Uh, and his witnesses on the defense side. Uh, that's how we should think about the players going forward. And here you see it, plaintiffs, defendants, the party who initiated the case, civil complaint, criminal charges, those will often be included in your mock trial packet. You'll see a copy of the charges, whether that's an information or indictment or a complaint. Um, and in a civil case, there'll be a lawsuit. There'll be the actual document filed to initiate the law school. And a key thing to remember, it's not going to make a lot of sense at this point, but a key thing to remember is the plaintiffs at least start with, and for the most part, maintain the burden of proof. They're the ones that started the lawsuit. They're the ones that started the criminal case, if it's the government or the prosecution. So they have the burden of proof. They're the ones that have to bring it home. They're the ones that have to demonstrate before the jury that there's competent and admissible evidence that reaches a certain level, uh, satisfies their burden of proof so that um, not only that the jury gets the case, but that the jury can make a finding in the case in their favor and give them the relief that they seek. Uh, the defendants, uh, they're, uh, they're the ones defending against those allegations. So again, Harry sues Sally. Harry's the one that brought the case. For Harry's the one that filed the complaint. Sally and her team of attorneys, they're the ones that are defending against these allegations. There's the ones saying, no, that's not the way it went down. That's not actually what happened. Uh, and oftentimes they have a different story to tell. Of course, if it's a criminal case, the criminal defendant, it's, it really comes down to, um, I, I'm not the one that did it, or you have it wrong, or I have a defense, or you just maybe have the wrong person here. Uh, but there's some reason that by that burden of proof that applies in a criminal case, they're saying the government has it wrong. That's why we're going to trial. Uh, and the way to think about this for these players and roles is in real life, civil cases are resolved by settlement all the time. Criminal cases are resolved by plea agreements and plea bargaining all the time. 
huge numbers, 90 some odd percent in different courts. So when it goes to trial, there's often a legitimate dispute. There's something that they can't agree upon. Lots of reasons cases go to trial, but mock trial sort of uh, demonstrates why that happens. Uh, cases go to trial because there's some good facts on either side and some stuff for the attorneys to work with. And every mock trial fact pattern has some good stuff on each side and some stuff to work with for the attorneys, or it wouldn't be a mock trial fact pattern. Here's some uh, in-depth discussion about some of the roles at trial. And really what I'm trying to do is separate out. This could be its own video. This could be a longer discussion. I'm going to devote about a minute to them in this basics video. And I hope to hear from you in the comments or an email. But to the left of the white line and the red lettering, those are roles that are not yours. Those are for lawyers, adults, people volunteering. They're going to help out with your mock trial, judges and jury evaluators. Uh, and your roles are part of these teams that we just discussed, uh, the plaintiff's counsel team, the attorneys representing the civil plaintiff or the prosecution of the government in a criminal case. The defense team, the one representing the civil defense team uh, and their witnesses and or the uh, in a criminal case, the criminal defendant, likely an individual. Uh, part of those teams are always going to be witnesses. Witnesses, as we'll discuss in later videos, come in two varieties. They're lay or percipient witnesses, folks that saw what went on. They have personal knowledge of what went on in the case. They're being called to testify under oath at this trial because they know something, they saw something that can purportedly contribute to one side or another's case. If the plaintiff calls them, if the government calls them, uh, then hopefully they have personal knowledge about something that advances the ball on their side. And the same stands true if they're called by the defense team. Um, sometimes we have a role for a lot of times new folks on our team or uh, or other folks that are on our teams to observe and to learn uh, as a bailiff. They might keep time. They might uh, go get witnesses. They might swear in witnesses. They might sort of serve as a courtroom deputy or or um, uh, someone who helps the judge and assists the judge. Those are some of the roles that are for you. Uh, on the left side, it, you know, there's a judge. Hopefully that's an attorney. Hopefully that's someone that's volunteering that's just gonna say overrule or sustain when there are objections, hear motions. And again, as a mock trial participant, whether you're a witness, but particularly if you're a counsel, this is where your deference is owed. This is where you're gonna say, yes, your honor. No, Your Honor. Your Honor, may I approach? Your Honor, may I enter the well? Your Honor, uh, may I take a moment to confer with co-counsel? This is where you're talking through, as we're going to talk about. The other evaluators, the ones that are deciding your fate in a mock trial sense to say who wins this competition or not, or or who prevails, or who did the best on uh, on their you know sort of mock trial performance, they sort of disguise themselves as jurors. They sit in the juror box. They they carry notepads. They don't have a role. They don't say anything during the entire trial until it's over and they provide some feedback. So uh, in ideal settings, there'll be some attorneys, there'll be some evaluators that are sitting in the jury. You're talking to them when you're doing your jury addresses and you're presenting to them when you're uh, doing your witness examinations. So those are the basic roles uh, of the trial. Next, we're going to talk about the parts or the order of a trial. You start to know some of the people now. We have plaintiffs and defendants. You have these teams. You have witnesses that you know are going to be a part of it. You have the roles that are not for you, like the judge and the jury, the other evaluators. Now, what are the parts in the order of trial? Okay. A very easy way to start talking about the parts of trial before we get into their actual batting order is just thinking about two broad categories. There are times as counsel, as an attorney on the mock trial team, I get to talk straight to the jury, or in this case, the, the evaluators in the case. I get to stand in the middle of the courtroom, in the middle of the well in the courtroom, in front of the counsel's tables, face the jury and talk to them and think about them as two bookends. I can talk to them in the front of the case, opening statement. It purposely is called an opening statement, not an argument, because I don't get to argue yet. There's no evidence in yet. It's a preview. It's a forecast. It's it's letting them know uh, in a roadmap type way what's to come at trial. You're going to hear from this witness. You're going to see this evidence. And, and in the end, we'll be back up to talk to you. The back bookend is the closing argument. That's when you're supposed to stand up as an attorney and argue. You're supposed to tell them what it all meant. When you heard from this witness, this is what it meant. When you take together this evidence and that evidence and the testimony of this witness, here's what it all means against the applicable law in the case. So I want you to think about it as 
Sometimes the biggest part of trial is when you get to turn as an attorney, face the jury, and make an argument, talk directly to them. Beginning of the case, opening statement, end of the case, closing argument. The whole in between is all about witnesses. Uh, each side in mock trial is given witnesses, two, three, four, maybe more witnesses. And you call them, and they're played by real people, oftentimes members of your own mock trial team. When you call as the plaintiff in a civil case or the prosecution in a criminal case, and you call a witness for your side, you're presenting that witness, you're the proponent of that witness, and you're on direct examination. You get to ask certain types of questions, open-ended questions, who, what, where, when, why, describe, explain type questions. Um, and the answers, the substance comes out of the witness's mouth, not your mouth. Uh, and then, as you know, you ask direct examination questions, the other side gets to get up. If I'm the plaintiff and I call the witness that saw the car accident from my side and they're a precipient witness, a lay witness that saw something, I present them on direct examination. The other side gets to get up and they get to ask their own questions and they get to do so on cross-examination. They get to ask a different type of question, what are called leading questions, questions that start out with the word you. You were on the corner that day. You saw the white van. You saw the color of the light, right? They're suggestive of one answer or another, often yes or no. Um, so thinking about trial is just you're either talking straight to the jury or you're presenting some form of witness testimony, either direct examination when you're presenting the witness, you're the proponent of the witness, or cross-examination when you're on the The last part has to do with court argument. There are places where a part of trial is court argument. Some mock trials actually have a formal argument where you're arguing to the trial judge beforehand, but most oftentimes it really is about uh, some of the rules and customs of trial. Who are you talking to when you object? If the other side's trying to do something and you want to object, and we're going to talk about objections, and we're going to talk about the rules of evidence, but if you're going to say, hey, they shouldn't be able to do that, objection. This is irrelevant, objection, this is unfairly prejudicial, objection, this is improper character evidence. You make that argument to the court. And the other side might say, this is not irrelevant because, this is not admissible hearsay because, this is not improper character evidence because. Uh, and you have an argument and that's to the court. So it's another part of trial, but think about it as really kind of a two and a half jury address, witness exam, the whole middle where you're putting in exhibits most likely through witnesses, and every once in a while a court argument. Those are your parts of trial. So those are the parts of trial, jury addresses, examinations, every once in a while a court argument. And then now's the batting order, and you can see the batting order, as I said, plaintiffs or prosecution in a criminal case, they're the ones that go first. They go first for the jury address. They go first for a presentation of the case and their witness exams. And there's, a, there's an order to trial. Every once in a while, we don't have a lot of time to go into it now, but there's some stuff that happens before the jury addresses. A judge may walk into a room and I may say, that call the case. This is Smith versus Jones. Here's its number. Counsel, make your appearances. And that just means you're standing up. Anytime you're talking to the court, you're standing up in most courts. And you're saying, my name is Wes Porter. I represent the plaintiff in this matter, John Jones. And so you're making your appearance. And in some courts, you know, you might be introducing, or some mock trials, you might be introducing your whole team, you might be introducing the witnesses, you might be introducing the coaches. But um, but there's appearances first, where we're formal about it. Here's the introduction of the case. Who are you? Why are you here? Uh, next, there might be what's called in some, in some mock trials, housekeeping matters. Are there rules? Are there questions? Are there things to ask before we get into the actual order of trial to begin with jury addresses? And, and even sometimes before that, there's some type of motions. Uh, Your Honor, before we begin this trial, I have a motion to bring. Um, and in high school mock trial, it might be a constitutional whole argument that seems like an appellate argument about some constitutional issue like a search and seizure or, or some substantive um, a legal issue. In, uh, in law school mock trials, every once in a while you'll argue the motions in limine or a fancy way of saying kind of drawn out objections where you have time to, to sit before the court and, and, and argue objections. So you might say, Your Honor, we have reason to believe as plaintiff's counsel in this case that the defense are going to bring a particular witness who has these problems and we have these objections to their testimony that we anticipate is going to come out at trial. So you might handle motions eliminate. Those are discussions that are through the trial judge, they're through the court, 
Uh, and in real life, a jury wouldn't be there for it. A jury wouldn't listen to your motions argument. But again, the jurors here are other attorneys that are serving as evaluators. So they're going to evaluate and watch you for all. But those are some things that take place before the batting order. And then the batting order is like this. Um, you see uh, the jury addresses start. Plaintiff goes first, then defendant. This is the opening statements. No argument, just forecast, just pathway, just uh, you know what we can expect at trial. Plaintiff's going to start to call their cases. When they call their direct examination and ask direct open-ended questions, who, what, where, when, why, describe, explain type questions. And then I have no further questions for this witness. And it's passed to the defense. The defense is now on cross-examination where they ask those leading type of questions, questions that often begin with you. You were at the bar that night. You were sitting in the third stool from the end. You had a few drinks. So you ask questions that are suggestive of an answer, often yes or no. Uh, and if there's something that's brought up, uh, the plaintiff may be able with witness one to get up and ask more questions. That's called a redirect. Your Honor, in light of the cross-examination, I have a few questions in redirect. But at some point, we're done with witness one. We proceed. Your Honor, at this time, as plaintiff, we call to the stand witness two. Witness two is sworn in. I have my direct examination, who, what, where, when, why, describe, explain type questions. Uh, Your Honor, I have no further questions for this witness. Then the defense has again their chance to ask leading questions, you type questions. You were the one that was in the parking lot that night. You didn't have a chance to see anyone. You just heard this from others who were at the scene. I ask questions that are asked in a specific type of way that are suggestive of an answer, the suggestive in particular of a yes, no answer. I get through my plaintiff's witnesses, one, two, maybe there's three, four or more, maybe some stipulations, certainly some evidence and some exhibits that come in through these witnesses. And at some point I say, your honor, the plaintiff has no further witnesses to call in this matter and the plaintiff rests. Now we're resting, we're not going to bed, we're resting, and that's the halftime. Often there's a break, but then we put on kind of the same batting order from the defense side. Now the defense is the one presenting, the defense is the proponent of the evidence, the defense is on direct examination, asking those open-ended questions, having the substance come through uh, on direct examination. And the plaintiff is in the position of being the cross-examiner, asking the U-type questions and confining those answers to the best they can to yes or no. At this time, the defense team rests its case. We go into closing argument. Remember, closing argument, plaintiff goes first. They have the burden. They're the ones saying, here's what it all meant. When you heard from witness one, when you heard from witness two, when you have the benefit of hearing my questions to the defense witnesses, witnesses three and four, here's what it all means. Here's what the exhibits mean. And you make their closing argument. Defense then goes and makes its closing argument. And often because they have the burden of proof, plaintiff has a rebuttal. That's the batting order. That's the general batting order of trial. And there's a lot to it, but that's the basics.